Good morning, church friends in house and online. Good morning. Uh, anyone that says God doesn't like to laugh or have fun should go check their theology. Um, but because God's a joyful God, He likes to see His His children and and His and His family and the body laugh. Um, so just. I want uh, just we're going to do an exercise right now. I just want you to close your eyes. And I want you to just think about your la the last 7 days. And I want you to find one thing that you can be joyful about. Just one thing and it doesn't have to be a big thing, doesn't have to be a small thing. Just one thing. If you want to stand with me, we're going to enter in. Moira's going to lead us into worship this morning. Um, so you can stand as we gather and we praise Jesus in the form of worship. So, Father, we just thank, thank you for sending your son to die on the cross. Thank you for giving the ultimate sacrifice that you gave your son, Jesus, so that we can be in relationship with you. Father, we thank you from your faithfulness for your people since the beginning of Genesis all the way till now, that your promises and your mercy and your grace has always been and will always be. Father, I just invite you into the space right now as we long to see you move. Father, I just uh, ask you to break off anything that's been carried in here this morning. Um, and that I just ask that you release a freedom into the room to worship as we would worship if we were standing in front of a little literal Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Moira. I'm going to read Psalm 46 to you this morning. For the director of music of the sons of Korah, according to the Alamoth, a song. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, for though its waters roar and foam, and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at a break of day. Nations are in an uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice and the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes war cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress.
There is a sound I love to hear It's the sound of the Savior's robe As he walks into the room Where people pray Where we hear praises He hears faith There is a sound I love to hear It's the sound of the Savior's robe As he walks into the room Where people pray Where we hear worship He hears faith Awake my soul and sing Sing his praise aloud, sing his praise aloud. Awake my soul and sing, sing his praise aloud, sing his praise Is your soul tired with everything you've been seeing and feeling, all the things you've been reading? Maybe your soul has fallen asleep. It's just too much. Jesus asked his disciples, will you not pray for me? Will you not pray with me for just one hour? They were asleep. The psalmist spoke to his soul. He said, Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God. For I will yet praise him. We're going to speak to our souls this morning. And tell our souls to wake up. Wake up. It's not a time for sleeping. Wake up. Awake my soul and sing. Sing his praise aloud. Sing his praise aloud. Oh, awake my soul and sing. Sing his praise aloud. Sing his praise. Aloud. Let's sing that again. 
Sing his praise aloud. Sing his praise aloud. Oh, wake my soul and sing. Sing his praise aloud. Sing his praise
Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all.
Father, you're a holy fire. And uh, just as uh, Moses encountered the burning bush, you light the, the bush, the, all the dry stuff that's, that's on us, and it just burns off like dross burning off of gold. And we thank you, Father, that you refine us in worship, that you take us to new places that we can encounter you. And we thank you, Lord, that you are the center of our lives, that you are the center of our calling, the, the one who makes our destinies pure and right and true. And Father, as we continue to worship this morning, we, we want to lay our lives down and say we love you, we adore you, we praise you. We thank you for being the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the one who's called us out of darkness and into the wonderful light of Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Continue to pray for us. Intercede on our behalf as we continue to worship you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to pray for Tracy now. She comes to the front. And if you'd uh, just stretch out your hand towards the front here. and Father, we gather around our sister knowing that she's worked hard on this uh, message and that um, you've been tilling her heart. You've been preparing uh, her all week long uh, for this message. And Father, we ask that you would rake our hearts right now and prepare us to uh, receive the seed of life that comes from the Word of God. And we thank you, Father, uh, for the things that you've planted inside our sister. And we pray that they come out with clarity now and uh, that there would be a forthcoming of the truth that's about to be shared into our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Andrew. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good to see all of you. Well, this morning, um, God has put a message on my heart on forgiveness. And this is a big journey, an important journey to walk through. And so uh, I'm going to take you on the journey that God has been taking me on over this last year, and I've entitled my message, Forgiveness Following the Way of the Cross, and we've entered the season of Lent as of Wednesday. Wednesday was Ash Wednesday. Um, we now are in the preparation for Easter, and so over the next six weeks, it's an opportunity and a time for us to prepare our hearts for Easter, and it's a time for us to seek and grasp the sufferings of Christ and to understand just how deep God's love is for us. And the Summerside Christian Council, which is made up of the churches in Summerside, is actually hosting a weekly Lenten devotional series by local pastors and reverends. And the focus will be on the seven last words from the cross. And this started this past Friday, and it will go until Good Friday, which is April 2nd. And I just want to encourage you to check it out and just hear these reflections and devotions, uh, and you'll find it on our Facebook page. And the seven last words from the cross are often used in Lenten practices to help us reflect on the sufferings of Jesus. And so I thought the first word from the cross, which which is in the order that they chose. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So forgiveness would be a great start for us during this time of Lent as we prepare for Easter. So in our world today, there is a much larger pandemic than COVID and its anger and hatred. Our culture takes justice and judgment into its own hands, but without God's wisdom. And in reality, this is not new. Life in the world hasn't changed. It's really the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And if you think back to Genesis, in the Garden of Eden, the serpent, 
the devil, basically said to Adam and Eve, well, you can't trust God. He's holding out on you. Don't you know that you can become like him and know good and evil? All you have to do is just eat the apple. That's all you have to do. So Adam and Eve chose not to trust God. Instead, they believed Satan, the deceiver, and wanting to be like God, they wanted to know good and evil. The reality is created beings cannot be God. That's the illusion, the deception. Only God can be God. This desire to be like God and not to trust God to be God and instead hand out our own judgments of good and evil continues. It's this human struggle. The truth is we aren't God and we don't have God's wisdom which is contained in the tree of life. If you think back to the garden, there was the two trees. So this mess that we're in continues. So human judgment and self-righteousness is not godly. It can't be. It's void of God's wisdom. And it can only be self-serving. It's sinful. It leads to division, all kinds of evil and ugly messes. And all we have to do is look on social media or watch the news Scripture tells us we have all sinned. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. Our sin creates a debt, and that debt has to be paid. And it comes with built-in consequences. The debt collector wants to collect, and he won't stop pounding you. On your own, you can't pay that debt. So you're going to prison. The illusion, the deception, is that we think we're in control. But the prison guards in Sin City Prison are calling the shots. So through Jesus' death and resurrection, God paid our debt because we can't. We can't pay that debt. So to step out of prison into freedom, we need to repent and we need to turn from our desire to, judge, to be the judge and to be the jury and to control our lives. So instead of us deciding our own truth and right from wrong, we submit to Jesus who provided a way to God so that we can now receive his wisdom from the tree of life. So with the Holy Spirit in our lives to come and to teach us God's wisdom, we learn how to discern real truth. We learn how to discern good and evil through him. Now discernment isn't easy. The struggle is that our hearts are crooked. And when we receive God's goodness and believe in him over our own way, we choose to instead submit to him and to be his disciple. So when we submit to him and we become his disciple, next we begin this journey of sanctification. And this is where we are changed into his image. This is where we're being transformed. So this is where we allow the Holy Spirit to begin the work of making our crooked mess, or taking our crooked mess and untangling it. So think of your heart as a garden full of weeds. You can imagine that for a second, a garden full of weeds. It's just overgrown. And the Holy Spirit is going to work carefully to remove the things that don't belong. So if we don't submit to this process, we can stay stuck. And we don't develop this discernment and this wisdom, and it's, it's hard work, and it's not for the faint of heart. And at times, as the Holy Spirit's removing these weeds, it can feel like surgery. And I think back to what David says in Psalm 51. He says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Even David, who Scripture says he's a man after God's own heart, he knew his heart needed to be cleaned and renewed, and that it was God that would do it. And then David says in Psalm 103, 13 to 14, he said, The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him, for he knows how weak we are. He remembers that we are only dust. God is our father, and we often sing, sing the song, Good, Good Father, and he is so much more and better than our earthly fathers. He is our good, good father. And Henry Nouwen shares this, um, just this devotion that's just really, really brings it home around how God is our parent. And Henry says, if there is no parent, 
we can't be lost. If we have no parent to return to, there is no experience of being lost. We are only lost when we can be found. Only in the light of goodness and forgiveness do we discover that we are lost. The love of a parent makes the child aware of being lost. The older son in the prodigal son story doesn't consider himself lost until he's confronted with this love expressed by the father on his prodigal brother's return. Only then does he touch his own lostness. The younger son, still apologizing, touches his lostness too. When he sees his father's forgiveness, the younger son prepares a story of apology because he doesn't fully understand the nature of his father's love. Only when he is received and welcomed and loved with this deep parental embrace is the depth of his lostness revealed to him. To say it another way, we only know that we're in darkness when we come into the light of God's love. It is only in the light, in the fullness of the sun that we know there is a shadow. Without light, there is no darkness. So the reality is that we don't even know we're lost and deceived until we experience him. So how do we keep ourselves from getting lost and deceived? Well, we hang out with Jesus. We spend time with him our father, as scripture calls him, and he calls him our good shepherd. So the Bible refers to mankind as sheep. Sheep are not all that smart, and they have no way to defend themselves. So it's really not a very flattering analogy to be called a sheep. Without a shepherd, without a pen, sheep are easy prey. We are easy prey. We need to be with our good shepherd every day, and we need to learn his rhythms, his voice, and his ways, and we're only safe with him. He is a friend, not a foe. So one thing that really impacts our hearts, that can put us into a, a pit, that can put us into prison, that can hurt our relationship with God and with others, is unforgiveness. So going back to Jesus on the cross when he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. Such a powerful statement. Forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. And this is our God crucified on a cross, and he had all of heaven's legions at his beck and call. He could have carried out justice right then and there before it all happened, but no. He dies a criminal death at the hands of cruel, short-sighted men and women that thought they thought they were doing God's will. They shouted, crucify him, crucify him. The crowds yelled it out. They were deciding good from evil. Because of my own sin, my stupidity, my desire for self-righteous judgment and justice, I can still get it wrong today. We can still get it wrong today, just like they got it wrong back then. It's sobering. We all need mercy and grace, grace to come out of the shadows, grace to have our hearts exposed, grace to know him and be known by him, grace to learn his rhythms, grace to humble ourselves and to follow his ways his voice. Jesus knew that his death was necessary, so he submitted to his Father's will for his suffering and death, knowing that it was accomplishing a higher purpose. He did it for joy of knowing that today we can be free from the clutches of this sinful program in our hearts and in our minds. So what tape or software are we going to run are we going to run, I'm in control, I'm going to do it my way? Or are we going to run, God, I submit to your will, you are in control? And every day we make this choice. It's not a one-time thing. It is a daily thing. And it can be, and it will be that way for our life on this earth. We're daily making choices. Will we submit to God's control? Will we follow his call, his wisdom? and not our own. And forgiveness is God's way. It's his wisdom for us. It's necessary. 
It's freedom from bondage and prison to sin. And it leaves God, when we forgive, it leaves God to do his work of justice and judgment, and it puts it back where it belongs. Forgiveness is God's nature, as is holy and righteous justice and judgment. Only God, only God knows our hearts. So only he can judge our hearts. And God forgives. It's his nature. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It's we who resist. We don't know we're lost until we're found, and we receive love and forgiveness. Think back to the prodigal son. We only know we're in darkness when we come into God's light. God has forgiven us. Our sin debt was paid for at the cross, but if we resist forgiveness, both receiving and extending, we get further away and our hearts get hard. Unforgiveness is our way and our desire for justice and self-righteous judgment, and it keeps us in bondage to sin and creates a wedge or separation from God's heart. It keeps us from receiving forgiveness and the freedom to fully experience all God has for us. So in Matthew 6.15, and this is from the message, it says, in prayer there is a connection between what God does and what you do. You can't get forgiveness from God, for instance, without forgiving others. If you refuse to do your part, you cut yourself off from God's part. Basically, if you refuse to forgive, you will not be forgiven. And it's interesting, in the New Testament, forgive, forgiveness, the word, is mentioned 38 times throughout the New Testament. So that's quite a few times. So forgiveness is not an option. It's not an optional thing. It's a requirement in our relationship with God. And so it's so important um, to God's heart. It's so important to him because it impacts our eternity with him. So again, think of God as a parent. As a parent, you will tell your children, don't go play in the road, and you'll be very clear and serious because the consequences, if the child does, is it could mean their death and their separation from you. So you're going to repeat that as many times to remind the child that this is not a good thing. Don't do this. So God is saying this, forgive, because of his deep love for us. He's telling us this because he loves us and he wants to be with us in eternity. And it's interesting, C.S. Lewis uh, says this. He says, love is far more stern and splendid than mere kindness. We get stuck here. I get stuck here. I'm not just preaching to you, I'm preaching to myself <laughs> as well. As a believer, we have received God's forgiveness, yet have we allowed it into the dark places of our souls, places we don't really want to expose or be dealt with? Without exposure, there cannot be healing. Without exposure, there cannot be healing. So if we don't allow and receive God's forgiveness into those hidden places and spaces we're going to find it really hard to forgive. We're going to find it hard to go deeper with God. We're going to struggle with getting free from things like anger, addiction, whether that's sexual, food, alcohol, drugs, work, etc., unhealthy ties to people or family, even physical illness. So are you carrying unforgiveness today that you're not meant to carry, either for yourself in an area I mentioned or towards someone else? And as Christians, we need to look at forgiveness from a spiritual place. So your soul, which is the seat of your mind, your will, and your emotions, doesn't have the capacity to forgive. Forgiveness comes from your spirit, which is God's wisdom, conscience, and communion, which is union with God. So our soul, when it comes to forgiveness, our mind, we analyze, well, what's right and what's wrong, and our bias gets in the way. Our will says, I want them to learn a lesson. I want my justice. And our emotions, anger, wants to lash out and punch or make them pay. So our soul hangs on to pain. Our spirit's response is, what does God, what does God say about this? And it turns to him first. And this takes 
this takes practice and discipline to go to God first, because oftentimes our emotions come up and we just want to lash out. So we've got to decide to, to, to shift and turn to God. And as we turn to God and our spirit, where God resides, we recognize, well, there is a hard heart here. The Holy Spirit is grieved by the actions of this individual or circumstance. They don't need any more anger heaped on them. So you begin to feel the love of God's heart, and you begin to see things from God's perspective, and you have a choice. Well, I choose my soul, anger, judgment, and I hope I get what they deserve, which puts us in this prison. Or will I choose my spirit, I choose God's way of love and forgiveness because I have been forgiven, which leads to freedom. So we go back to just that David psalm, Psalm 51, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. God, search our hearts and speak your truth and love this morning. So I want to walk us through some important forgiveness elements that I have been learning and walking through. Um, and it's from a book called Identity Restoration by Ray, Lee, right? Ray Light. Sorry, his name is, last name is Light. And he has this short and powerful teach I want to walk us through. And then we're actually going to do an activity together. So we're not just going to learn about forgiveness today in our heads. We're going to have an opportunity to step into what it means to forgive and to receive forgiveness. So as I shared, forgiveness is a key element to a lifestyle of freedom and healing and hope. So without forgiveness, we end up living a life filled with turmoil, hurt, anger, broken relationships. And you know what? You've heard this before, I'm sure. Hurting people hurt people. And it just continues this cycle of hurt. And for some, forgiveness can be very confusing. And I've learned this as I've been talking to a few people this week, and I know this even for myself. How do I know, how do I know if I've forgiven? How do I know if I've forgiven properly? What if I've really worked on forgiving someone and I'm still triggered every time I see them and have an unhealthy reaction to them? Maybe you've experienced getting angry, feeling fear or shame, or you feel this emotional hurt and then you have to try to forgive all over again. And this cycle can continue and you just can't seem to get over the past. And there are several, several potential reasons for this because it could be a boundaries issue meaning you could be allowing certain behaviors from people without setting appropriate relational boundaries. Today we are just going to focus on forgiveness, but if you want to dig into boundaries, there are wonderful resources out there. Dr. Henry Cloud, I actually have signed up for his um, website, and I get his daily uh, one-minute talks because it's just so helpful on boundaries. Uh, Havila Cutting Cunnington uh, has a wonderful course too on I Do Boundaries, which a number of people have walked through in January, I know, online. She had a free course. And so those are some options if you want to dig into boundaries. So for forgiveness, we're going to dig into that today. One of the potential reasons for a forgiveness cycle can be that I'm trying to figure out how to forgive because I really want to, but I could be engaging in a practice of self-righteous judgmentalism instead of forgiveness. So this is back to Eden. Eden, I want my way. I want to be in control versus God's way and submitting to his control. And it's our soul versus our spirit. So this is different than simply not being able to forgive. When dealing with the problem of self-righteous judgmentalism, you may think you have forgiven, but it seems like it just didn't work. So my hope is, as we go through this, that you can, truly, that you can learn to truly forgive and be free from areas where you feel stuck and where you're still feeling the pain so I want to start by digging into scripture. I want to dig in, and we're going to look at four Greek words used in the New Testament for forgiveness. And I actually learned when I looked up how many times is forgiveness listed in the New Testament, it said um, 38. But there's actually, um, the word in Greek um, that can be translated forgive is actually used 147 times. It doesn't always translate to forgive in English. It can translate differently. And so that is even more than 38 times. So the first scripture that we're going to look at is uh, Luke 6, 37. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. So the Greek word here is apoluo. And I had to listen to some... <laughs> 
how do you say these words? Apaluo, and it means to free fully, relieve, release, dismiss, let die, pardon, divorce, let depart, forgive, let go, loose, send away, set at liberty. Lots of words there. Next scripture, Ephesians 1, 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. And the Greek word for forgiveness here is aphesis, and it means freedom, pardon, deliverance, forgiveness, liberty, or remission. And then in Luke 11, verses 2 to 4, And he said to them, when you pray, so this is the Lord's Prayer, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. And the Greek word for forgive here is apheami, and it means to send forth, cry, forgive, forsake, lay aside, leave, let alone, let go, let have, omit, send away, remit, suffer or yield up. And then in Colossians 2.13, it says, In you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. And this Greek word is, this is where I had to practice my ha. <laughs> it's, um, oh my goodness, now I'm not going to say it. Uh, it's har ezerum, har ezerum, um, and it means to grant as a favor, gratuitously, in kindness, pardon, rescue, deliver, forgive, freely give, or grant. So the next slide I have has all of the words um, that that basically translate from this Greek word to what we use in English as forgive or forgiveness. So just look at those different words. It's pretty significant. Our English language doesn't always take in the vastness of the meaning of some of these words. So now I just want to look at two scriptures that Ray Light shares that have helped form his understanding of forgiveness and has really impacted myself as well and has helped many people experience hope and freedom. And Ray does inner healing work and identity restoration work. So the next scripture is Ephesians 4.32. It says, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as, Christ, as God in Christ forgave you. And then Colossians 3.12-13 Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. Now these two scriptures seem to express that we forgive as the Lord forgave us. This is different than forgiving because the Lord forgave us. Yes, there's a difference here. That concept is covered in other scriptures. The Lord forgave because, forgave because, sorry, forgive because the Lord forgave us. But when you say forgive as the Lord forgave us, there's a difference here. I don't know, as, the Greek word as here is kathos, and it means just as, in as much, according to, even as, How? So if you add those, all those words together, this is how the scripture would read. So as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, put on compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bear with one another and be kind and tenderhearted to one another. If one has a complaint against another, forgive one another just as, in as much as, according to, even as, and how God in Christ forgave you, so you must also forgive. Whew. So the question, or so these scriptures seem to be expressing that we forgive in the same way, just as, according to, and how Jesus forgave us. So the question is, how 
were we forgiven? So in Ephesians 1, 7, it says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Matthew 26, 26 to 28 says, Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and he gave thanks and he said to them, and he gave it to them saying, Drink of it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. The redemption and forgiveness we have through the shed blood of Jesus, which is poured out on the cross according to the riches of his grace. Jesus being crucified is how we are forgiven. We forgive by the blood of Jesus Christ. So I talked about earlier the soul forgiveness and the spiritual forgiveness. We forgive by the blood of Jesus Christ. So now I want to look at the difference between forgiveness and self-righteous judgmentalism. And I call this false forgiveness, and I've got two. There's two false forgivenesses that we can get stuck in. One is trying to use understanding to stir up compassion so we can forgive is part of the reason why it seems like forgiveness doesn't always work. We don't need to know how the individual that hurt us was hurt themselves or why they did what they did. Understanding is not part of the forgiveness process. The forgiveness that Jesus shows us is not circumstantial. If you look at what process really is, you will find that what is happening is not forgiveness at all. We can call it whatever we want, but trying to analyze the life of someone who hurt you so you can stir up compassion in order to forgive them isn't compassion. That's not compassion. It doesn't work because that is just us looking at what happened to them and judging whether it was bad enough, according to our self-defined standards, to give them the right to be forgiven. That is us deciding whether they deserve to be forgiven or not and determining whether their pain and suffering was bad enough to warrant forgiveness. That is self-righteous judgmentalism. And this is one of the possible reasons why even though you think you've forgiven someone a hundred times, you still get triggered and have unhealthy reaction every time you see them. It may be because you've not forgiven them you self-righteously judge them 100 times. That may be why forgiveness hasn't worked. And I, when I first heard this, I was like, whoa. <laughs> okay, God, <laughs> we have to do some work. Um, it's so easy to fall into that because that's what our soul does. That's what our soul wants to do. False forgiveness number two is thinking because you've done the same thing. Well, of course I can forgive them. Now, this may sound good, but this is, just as, this is just us basing forgiveness off of our own behavior again instead of the blood of Jesus Christ. And so really think about that for a minute. Who do we think we are? So then how ridiculous is it? It's self-righteous judgmentalism. It's not forgiveness. So adding to the problem with these false forms of forgiveness is that both require some sort of intellectual filing system to manage all this information. There's a burden that comes with self-righteous judgmentalism because we are deciding that we're the judge and jury. So we have this system in our mind. Somehow we have to keep track of all our behaviors, other people's behaviors, and those self-defined standards of forgiveness. And that's a lot of work, and it doesn't bring the freedom and healing that Jesus forgiveness provides. It's the completeness of the blood of Jesus that brings freedom and healing. So in Colossians 2, 13 to 14, it says, and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt. So we talked about debt early. He's canceled the record of debt that stood between us with its legal demands this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Thank you, Jesus. <coughs> so what about when 
we won't forgive, or we think, I just, God, I just can't forgive in this situation. What about that? What about that pain? Jesus allowed himself to be crucified on the cross to cancel the debt for our sins. So for some reason, though, we tend to have some debts that we just can't or will not release. So let's look at some scriptures here. Um, and let's go back to two of the scriptures we looked at, remembering the Lord is asking us to forgive as he forgave in his blood, not on our own strength. So Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Colossians 3.12-13, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. So you must also forgive. I think one of the aspects for forgiving is allowing our old selves to be crucified with Christ to release the debts we believe that people owe us. Now, let's be clear. I'm not suggesting that we should be other people's saviors. We are not to be other people's saviors. That's, that's God's role. What I'm suggesting is that we truly believe the good news and allow our old self to be crucified with Christ. Galatians 2.20, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, and now the life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And then he says in Galatians 6, 14, be, but far be it from me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. So by faith we are crucified with Christ. It is no longer we who live. It is no longer we who live, it is Christ living in us. We have been fully crucified to the world. The world has been fully crucified to us. We are no longer that old self. We no longer need to hold on to those old, dead debts of the world. If we have been crucified with Christ to the world, the world has been crucified to us. It is no longer we who live, but it is Christ who lives in us. Then who owes us anything? Who owes us anything? So our inability or unwillingness to forgive is based on a lie. And there are many variations of the lies the enemy uses to poison us with unforgiveness. Yes, we have been wounded. And I am not discounting the experiences and the emotional hurt of those woundings. However, these lies are just a rejection of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And he wants you to be free. He wants you to be free. And sometimes we don't even know what those lies are, and we don't want to accept that they are lies. The truth is, it is absolutely possible to forgive everybody for everything that we are still hanging on to. Our God does so covered in the blood of Jesus, so can we. So with this in mind, 2 Corinthians 2, 10 to 11, anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. Indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, it has been for your sake in the presence of Christ, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan if we were not ignorant of his designs. He would want us to stay in our pain. He would want us to stay in our prisons. He would want us to stay trapped. But Jesus says, I want you to be free, and there is hope. Submit to me. Now, Ray Light shares that based on Scripture, he intentionally allows himself to be aware of the presence of Jesus whenever he's forgiving someone. And applying this has helped him find out if there's a lie in the way of extending forgiveness, just asking Jesus to be with us when we forgive. Forgiveness in the presence of Christ through the blood of Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit, not on our own strength, allowing the old self to be crucified, thereby canceling any debt owed to you, this will transform your life. And incorporating these principles into your life will allow you to easily forgive and be set free 
from the burden of unforgiveness. And that's what it is. It's a burden. And Galatians 5 says, 5, 1 says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore. Stand firm and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Unforgiveness is slavery. So now that we've looked at the principles of forgiveness, we can apply them to any areas where we have intentionally not forgiven or where we have self-righteously judged instead of forgiven. And so today, like I mentioned, we're going to have the opportunity to release any of the unforgiveness, hurt, self-righteous judgment, and filing systems we have been using. And so um, we're going to engage our hearts this morning. And you can engage with as much as your heart is ready to. And I'm going to invite um, Ruth Plester to make her way up here. Um, she's going to help me walk us through this process of forgiveness. And your heart doesn't have to do anything it doesn't want to. It still may not be ready to forgive. And if that's the case, I would recommend having patience for yourself and seeking trusted help. But this is what we're going to do. We're going to allow ourselves to be in the presence of God as a community together, acknowledging any unforgiveness and repenting from self-righteousness, self-righteous judgmentalism, releasing any false standards and filing systems. We're going to forgive and we're going to receive the truth. And so I'm going to invite Ruth up, and I believe the mic is perfect over here. Thank you. And we're gonna, we're gonna, we're not just gonna hear the word today. We are going to, we're going to do the word today. So I'm gonna hand the mic over to Ruth, and she's gonna walk us through this. And then we're gonna follow it by communion. We're gonna come together to the Lord's table after we go through this exercise, and we're gonna receive from Him at the table. Thank you, Tracy. That was a lot to digest. There's a lot there, yes. A lot to digest, so it's kind of cool. It's going to be on the website. <laughs> yeah. Tracy asked me to, first of all, before we do the exercise for giving somebody else, to receive the gift of God's forgiveness for ourselves, which is so huge. And it, when she asked me, I was reminded of um, what happened to myself quite a number of years ago when I was in ministry school and I was trying to receive the revelation of the cross, not just in my head. I, I always know Jesus died for my sins. I know it in my heart. I believe it. But I, I wanted it to go so much in my core that I would wake up in the morning and know it, just like I know that two plus two is four and the sky is blue. And I just couldn't get it. And so there's one day in ministry school, everybody was super excited about Jesus. And I just sat there and I, I said to Jesus, I, I will always love you, but I, I need you to give me the revelation because I, I can't get it. And I burst out crying, and I ran out of school, and I went home. <laughs> and um, a couple of days later, I was invited to a workshop. A lady was giving a worship. There was about six of us. And after the worship, she prayed for me. And she put her hand on my back, and she broke off the spirit of punishment. I was like, oh, that's interesting. I've never heard of that before. It was probably two days after that that the revelation of the cross came, that even I have been forgiven for the things that I did wrong. I always thought I, I didn't deserve to be forgiven. All of you are, but not me. And I don't have to earn it. I can't work for it. It's a free gift. And that's, that's when everything changed for me with Jesus. It's a free gift. So if you resonate with this, would you mind if I just pray for you? If in any way you feel you don't deserve it, that we can break off this spirit of punishment or the lie that you have to work for forgiveness? Would you, would you mind putting your hand on your heart with me? So Holy Spirit, I ask you to come here in the building, online, and I ask you to come 
with your power and your might and your love and your compassion and your gentleness. And I ask in the name of Jesus that you break off the lie that we have to earn our salvation and that we have to work for it and we work for forgiveness. And I break off the spirit of punishment of each and every one of us in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. And with that, before we forgive someone else, the hardest person to forgive is yourself. But it's imperative. It's a command. That's what he died for. He died for you. He died for all of you, not just your sins. He died for all of you. So I'd like you to think of some things in your head that you're not proud of, or some mistakes that you made. You can even write them on a piece of paper in your head if you're a visual person. And let's just pray with me now, in your mind or in your heart, Jesus. Thank you that you died for all these things. Thank you that your forgiveness covers all of these things that I'm not proud of. And now, and please repeat after me, I choose to forgive myself. I choose to forgive myself. For. And just list them for the Lord. And I bless myself. And I release myself from all the harm done to me. So Jesus, I give you all these things. What do you give me in exchange? And just first thing that comes crosses your brain. Let him give you something and it has to be good because he's good. If you don't get anything today, he will give you something maybe later today or tonight. So today, I received your gift of forgiveness for myself. Yeah. Now we're going to go back to the slides. Can we have the first slide, please? Let's ask Jesus together. And if this doesn't make total sense, it'll, it will. We'll pray that it all come together in your heart. But we're just going to go through the exercise. So let's ask Jesus. Jesus, would you please establish the truth of the cross and what you accomplished on the cross between me and... Who are you forgiving today? And now that we have acknowledged God's presence and the truth of the cross right there in your heart, let's repent from any self-righteous judgmentalism. Let's ask God, are there any false standards of forgiveness I have established in my heart. And I will add, are there any misconceptions or preconceived ideas in my heart about forgiveness? And as the Lord reveals, let's just repent together. Jesus, I am sorry for any false standards and self-righteousness judgmentalism that I used instead of forgiving. I break agreement with all false standards 
all the self-righteousness and all the judgmentalism I used or expectations that I have of others. I break those as well. And now I release to you all of that information, all the ways I kept track of that information and all the ways I gathered that information. I just give it all to you. Just pretend it's a balloon and you let it all go and it goes up and it disappears. Just let him remove all those things from you. Just release it. You can experience in any way that works for you. We all work differently. You may feel lighter. You may see him do something. Or you may get impressions of people or events that have a different perspective than you had before. Just stay with Jesus. And as always, when we let something go, he gives us something in exchange. And it's always an upgrade. So let's ask him, Holy Spirit, is there anything you would like to give me in return? to be good. I thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing in the room and everywhere that you're touching hearts right now. We just thank you for the revelation that's coming. And now, now that we are ready to forgive that particular person that's come to mind, uh, let's, let's forgive that person for whatever it is that they wounded you for. So we can let that go, release it, let it go, abandon it um, truly as we have been forgiven today. So let's do the next slide. And let's say together, Jesus, I come into agreement with you and your forgiveness. And I completely forgive by your blood, through the power of the Holy Spirit. I choose to release them completely, and I agree that they owe me nothing, and I bless them. Just follow the lead of the Holy Spirit and forgive and release as much as you need to. Just take your time. And we just thank you, Jesus, that it's done now. So, Jesus, before we finish up, is there anything you want me to know today? And I just declare today that you are free in his presence. You are free to take his hand and walk into the future because there's no circumstance that there's no solution for because he has got the whole world in his hands even when it doesn't look like it. So we seal this message and this application and I just ask you Holy Spirit that you made make this real 
in our core over the next while. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Ruth. Holy Spirit is so gentle. I'm going to call up Moira. Um, and to part of sealing this is we're going to take communion together. And so for those of you who are serving communion this morning, if you want to head to the tables, there's a table on either side of the room. And uh, so we're just going to worship together and just soak in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Moira has uh, prepared a song called Communion uh, for us so that we can just really just receive his love and his forgiveness this morning and just come to the table together and to partake of his, of his body and his blood and remember what he did for us. Uh, and so if you would stand, um, and I'm going to just release you to go to the tables, and Moira's going to begin our worship as well. And when we all come back together, we're going to partake together. Take me back to communion. Lead me back to the moment I saw your face. And it was oh so simple. It was easy to love. And no space between us. So this morning, 
just that reminder, like he is our friend, he's not our foe, and we are invited to the table, and so um, just even to imagine you're at the table with Jesus and his disciples, you are invited there, you are welcome there, you are wanted there, and so we come to the table, and we're all welcome, and so I'm going to read from Matthew 26, and we're going to partake together. So now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, take, eat, this is my body. Let's partake together. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let's share together. So, Father, we just we thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you for your love, and we thank you for what you've accomplished for us on the cross. And we're so thankful, Father, that we continue to grow and learn, and that this is a journey, and that there is hope in the journey, and that there is freedom in the journey, and that we just keep um, seeking your kingdom first, and all these things will be added to us, Father. And so we thank you for your hope and your promises this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to sing together with Moira, uh, and then I will come up and we'll close the service after. This is where I'm meant to be.
much to carry Everything to God in prayer Oh, what peace we often Where the dead things come back to living I feel 
I just want to just remind us that God is for you. He is for you this morning. And he sees you and he loves you and just wants you just to receive his gifts for you as you go into your day. And so I just want to sign off online um, and just say thank you so much for being with us this morning. <laughs>